down in a time frame where everybody can go, oh, that's where it is, then it creates a little confusion. Sometimes um, in my own playing, I've tried to deal with that issue. Um, whenever you go into a recording studio, you're faced with that issue. Sometimes things that you thought were kind of flowing nicely, then you listen to yourself back and you realize, wow, that's kind of awkward sounding. What am I doing there? And then you have to adjust. Record yourself often and uh, take a very objective look at what you're doing and see if you can shape some things in a different way. Uh, I think it's really instructive. Does anybody have any questions about anything for any of us? Hi, I have a question for Bob. Um, I'm a saxophone player. And sometimes I notice when I'm playing my lower register, my harmonics come in. I wonder how do you um, kind of curve that problem? Good question and serious problem. Um, the tenor saxophone is quite a long tube that's actually folded over in half and it has what's called a conical bore which is to say as you go further down the tube it gets larger. So as you play lower notes you're in effect pushing down more keys and creating a space in which the air has further to go which means you have to blow harder and support more f with the diaphragm to get the note to come out full and without, as you say, getting harmonics and doing strange things. So a lot of it uh, is based on proper breathing and uh, we use a diaphragm form of breathing to play the saxophone. So that, that's where you need to look to uh, address that problem. Well, I also notice it happens when my lip starts to get tired too. Uh, I think breathing really is the key. I mean, the way I choose to think about playing the saxophone is all, everything that happens is floating up on top of the air. You know, if the air stream is vibrant and healthy, then my fingers are free to do whatever they will and the, the tone is free to go all kinds of different places. If I'm not breathing with enough support from the diaphragm, things get really strange very quickly. Thank you. My question is to Peter, when do you compose uh, where do you begin as a drummer? Uh, you have to come up with harmony and melody, obviously. Where do you begin? The, uh, the place I begin uh, for any, any kind of compositional enterprise or, or, or exercise is, is usually melody. Um, I mean, rhythm is naturally going to be there um, because as soon as you place one note and then a second note after that, you've created a rhythm sequence. You've started, you've started a, a suggestion of time and, uh, and you're on your way. So uh, the rhythm kind of takes care of itself. I don't, um, I don't think of a drum beat and then, uh, and then say, hmm, let's see what I can build on top of that. Uh, so it, uh, you know, whether I'm sitting at a, at a piano or using a, a synthesizer with a computer, you know, like a sequencer. Uh, actually, most of my composing takes place when I'm sitting on an airplane or, you know, walking the dog, stuff like that. Um, and I just start imagining music, and, and it's not just melody. I think for all of us, it's, it's kind of like, you know, music is, is kind of like three-dimensional chess or or real-time architecture or something, you can just see and hear all the different dimensions in terms of melody, harmony, and rhythm. So it all kind of comes together. Hi, this is for, this is for John. Uh, I would like to hear you talk a little bit about how uh, versus the electric versus the upright, how you place your notes around the beat. I listened a lot to Ron Carter and Ray Brown and a lot of guys. It would take a, a long time to list all the guys that I've checked out, but Ron was a big inspiration. And I noticed that when he played with Miles and when, when he played with a lot of guys, when he played jazz, that is 4-4, four, four, swinging kind of playing, he had a way of being relaxed but playing a little, bit on, a little bit on top. In other words, the music had a forward motion, but it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't moving forward necessarily. It didn't have to rush to have this little energy on it. In other words, he wasn't relaxing so far that it was sort of in the middle part of the beat or laid back. He was up on it saying, okay, this is where it's at. And so that's one way to play. Then uh, that, that works in a certain, and that's also, he was playing with Tony Williams and Miles' band, so they had a synergy they, that worked a certain way with those two. 
Then say, if you're playing New Orleans music, sometimes we get into sort of a thing on Peter's tune. We're kind of laying back. We have some, we're letting, we're trying to make the, the notes fatter, rounder. We're letting go of them a little bit more slowly. We're, we're laying back on the beat. That's a different kind of vibe. If you're playing funk, I mean, there's different schools of that. You can say, okay, this guy plays more laid back. This guy's more on top. I mean, there's different ways to do it. On the electric bass, I found, again, there's all sorts of different touches. And where you play versus you know, where your back pick up middle or even on the front for a darker sound, uh, that's going to influence the way the notes are uh, created and also how they're felt. If you play up towards the, the fingerboard, they're darker. And if you're playing electric bass and you have to play something swinging, you might want to play up there more. Um, Jocko did incredible things at the bridge pickup and also all over the place. He was all, you know, beautiful phrasing. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the tune at hand. And, and it's always dictated by the song. That's the way I look at it. That the song and the creation of the composer influenced me. It kind of tells me right away once I hear the melody and the sort of the general pulse and the tempo, that influences how I'm going to articulate and whether I'm going to ride on top or in the middle or whatever. And a lot of times you don't even, you're not even thinking consciously, oh, I have to do this. It's just natural. You know, reggae music, you kind of lay back. I mean, it's what they do, right? And then, and then different music, you know, you just, part of it is just uh, intuition and some of it is having the ability to control it. You should have a choice, actually, when you play. That's what I tell my students. You need to have a choice. You shouldn't have to play on top because that's the only way you play. And you shouldn't have to lay back and almost drag because that's the only way you play. You should be able to place it accordingly for the music at hand. I don't know how many of you out there you know, have been told, hey, can you play a little more ahead of the beat or can you play a little more behind the beat? And I never quite understood what that meant. And, and, and so I, uh, you know, I kind of reduced it to guesswork. You know, as John was saying, well, well just you know, hope it doesn't slow down and, and play a little behind the beat. Um, for me, again, it was, uh, it was this process of singing the subdivisions, mm -hmm. and then automatically the phrasing takes care of itself. You know, if you're playing a big band chart, like a bassy kind of a big band chart, or an Ellington chart, um, or playing in a, in a bebop group, or playing a samba, or playing, you know, some kind of New Orleans second line, groove, whatever, if you're singing that music and singing the rhythmic subdivisions, and I don't mean counting, but just singing these offbeats, it seems to automatically happen. Um, and, and that's how you find these different parts of the beat. So yeah. I just wanted to clarify, it's not, it's not anything random or, or, no, or it's anything not guessing. like guesswork. It's not guessing. I'd like to address a question to most of the band, I guess, is where you feel you're at in your careers, because you're pretty staggering playing now, and you know, how much more is there you can go? Just trying to do more of the same, you know, trying to uh, keep doing this and, and getting better as a musician. I think that's the main thing I would like to do, just keep becoming a better player so I don't fight this thing, you know, because I still fight the guitar a lot, you know. I think we all have our places on our instrument where we just can't get beyond. That's what I'd like to do is, in terms of my career is just play better. Uh, I'd like to add a little something to that. Um, I think it's true that the four of us up here are perhaps some of the busier musicians on the scene today, and I think it really must be said that this is due in great part to the fact that each of the four of us is quite versatile and has always strived to play in a variety of styles. Hence, uh, there are a lot more opportunities available to each of us uh, in terms of working and playing with different kinds of bands. I beg you all to try to keep an open mind and strive for diversity, uh, not only as a player, but as a composer, as an arranger, as an instigator, as a producer, whatever the case may be, to just broaden your horizons, which will, in fact, enable you to uh, be quite a bit more active in music. Yeah. I think, and, and I think, um, I guess the main thing we're all looking forward to doing and trying to do is becoming stronger as musicians, not just on the instrument that we play. I think we all have desires to be better composers. And um, I know for me, that's a big one. I'm working on that. I want to be 
want to write for different kinds of things, write for big forms more often, and uh, grow in, in all aspects, not just on my instrument or instruments that I happen to be dealing with, but uh, overall musicianship. And composition is a big one, because that's where that leads you into directions musically that you want to go. If you're writing music in a certain way, then it leads you down the path to playing a certain way. And um, I would encourage you all to write music um, and, uh, and try to still the critical voices inside of yourself that say, well, I can't write a tune. Or if you start writing one, oh, that's no good. Write one anyway. Try to write something. Start writing every day. Try to write, even if you write four bars, eight bars, it doesn't matter. The process of composition will help your playing, and it'll also open you up as, as, a, as a musician in general, so you won't be so second and third guessing, because a lot of guys have, have that problem when they play, too. They, every time they play something, they think, oh, that's terrible, oh, oh, I shouldn't play that. And meanwhile, there, there's dialogue going on, they don't even have the, the chance to listen to the guys around them, so that's something else to think about. Anyway, here is a, uh, a new tune by John Abercrombie. This is something that's called That's For Sure. Thank you. 
We're going to play one more tune. I want to uh, again thank the D'Addario company, all the uh, members of the D'Addario family for being so generous and for having the great idea to put this band together and allow us to, to travel and play and for making such wonderful music, musical products. Uh, we're going to close the concert with a uh, composition by Bob Mincer. This is something he calls Modern Day Tuba. Thank you. 